This is Twit. Apple, of course, we've been here, you know, Apple has been this player on the outskirts of AR and VR for quite a while. We've heard, we've, you know, heard that Apple's working on something. Details have been very scant. And uh, the industry itself, it's kind of an interesting time for AR and VR. It's kind of like, is it really a thing that, that you know, these companies need to continue investing in? Well, Apple apparently is and plans to release some hardware. And we've got some uh, extended details on that, thanks to a report on the information written by Wayne Ma, who joins me now. Welcome to the show, Wayne. Jason, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really happy that I could get you for a few minutes to talk about, uh, to, to, I don't know, reveal some information about this headset because it's been <laughs> so shrouded in mystery. And I think the the question that I have before everything else is, by the time Apple brings out something, like, is it going to be too late? I mean, I feel like I feel like there's so much uncertainty around, like, if, you know, AR and VR deserves all of the attention that it's gotten in the past few years. Well, if you think about it, Apple usually isn't a first mover, right? They yeah. just sort of sit on the sidelines and wait for other people to kind of do it first. So, you know, the smartphone, the personal computer, even the iPod, right? Mm -hmm. the, those weren't the first, you know, digital MP3 players or smartphones to come out. And so I think that, you know, based on, you know, my reporting on the technologies that are in this headset, you know, they're still far beyond, you know, what's currently on the market now. You know, they can they can afford to wait and kind of uh, take their time on this. No question they're ahead of some of the technologies that are out on the market right now. Also ahead on the cost. I mean... Are we still looking at like a three thousand ish dollar uh, headset uh, setup? Yeah, that seems to be the case based on my you know talking to people who've worked on it. You know what yeah. they've heard, it's going to be pretty expensive. But that's also because it has all these new technologies that haven't been invented. Uh, that had to be invented for the headset. Yeah, no kidding. Well, let's start with the design aesthetic. Often, when I think of Apple and the things that you know I really appreciate about Apple's approach uh, to hardware, <laughs> is that they really do actually put a lot of thought. And uh, and uh, time into how the how how things look and kind of the uh, the operational aesthetic of the the design and how that integrates with the features and the functionality in there. So, what can you share that we didn't already know about kind of the design of this headset? I mean, one of the big things is, you know, if you compare it to other AR VR headsets in the market, for example, uh, the most obvious being the Quest Pro, uh, the head, the actual battery for the headset is actually not in the headband. It's not integrated. You don't wear the battery you are on your head. You, it's, it's, a, it's like a, on your waist. It's a pack. It's, uh, you connect it by a cable to the headset. Uh, I, you know, for me, that was a big shocker, you know, given Apple's penchant for, you know, cable-free designs. Yeah, so that's then on your hip. You've got the battery on your hip, not integrated in the headset. It sounds like this kind of went back and forth, which makes sense. I'm sure Apple has iterated a lot around this. Why then, why do you think that it ends up there? That seems like a step backwards when we're talking about what we've seen from other companies. And when I think about a hardware device that's uh, competing with you know uh, devices that are a third of the cost, yet those devices seem more all in one versus this kind of like extended hardware detail. Why, why do you think that is? Is it just that it powers for longer or something else? I think it's both a design and practicality um, issue. Uh, I, you know, the headset has these really powerful processors, you know, they're very power hungry. So you need a big battery, but if you have a big yeah. battery, uh, you know, that battery can generate heat and get hot. It's also very heavy uh, and that weighs the headset down. Then you can't wear it for very long periods of time um, by having it uh, on, on, you know, by having it separate, you can swap it out easily, you know, if you want to, you know, use the headset for longer. Um, and I know that internally, um, you know, Johnny Ive was involved in the design of this, you know, he felt that uh, it was just way too constricting, you know, mm. uh, it was almost like, uh, you know, it was like very bulky and so forth. So it's both a design and I think practical aspect, you know, it makes the headset lighter so you can wear it for longer. Yeah. And I think the jury is really still out on, on how we feel about putting something on our head to begin with when it comes to technology. If we're putting something on our head and that's already a hill to a steep hill to climb, and then that's something that we're putting on our head is also very heavy considering the amount of power it needs to supply to everything to do all of these cool things. That's that's an even steeper hill to climb. So maybe, you know, it's a balancing act there. Not to mention, it really seems like this is a device that is not intended for consumers. Who do you think it's it's poised to be matched up with? Is this a total enterprise play? 
Well, it's a good question. I mean, uh, a lot of people want to compare it with the iPhone yeah. in terms of how revolutionary mm -hmm. they want it to be. But actually, people who have worked on it say it's more closer to the, the, the Macintosh that came out in 1984. You know, when that computer came out, it was revolutionary. It brought the computer mouse to the mainstream. It brought graphical user interfaces, right, with, you know, with Windows and software to the mainstream. But it was $2,500 in 1984 dollars. You know, mm -hmm. that's more than $77,000 now. Uh, but, you know, gradually the Mac got more and more popular and, you know, defined the personal computer revolution. Evolution. So I think that that's more of a comparison to this headset than the iPhone would be. Right. If we're 20 years ahead, what, what does it look like 20 years from now? I don't even know. Uh, but I guess we didn't even know then what things would look like now. So that's just the way it all works. Um, you wrote a little bit about uh, the motorized system for the lenses, which really seems to be, I don't know, I, which I can totally respect the fact that when we're putting things on our eyes, not everyone's eyes are made the same. Uh, there's a whole lot of, you know, complications that that can arise. Talk a little bit about how this emphasizes flexibility for the people who might actually wear these lenses. Yeah, I mean, one of Apple's big things is, is uh, inclusion, right, diversity. Right. And so they want to be able to uh, have as many people as possible be able to use this headset. And so uh, one is um, it's very crucial that the lenses align directly, you know, correctly with your eyeballs. Uh, other devices like the Quest, uh, like the Quest 2, for example, has only three settings, you know, three different eye distance settings. Mm -hmm. You're just stuck with those three, right? Um, so this one, you know, it's it's a motorized automatic system that adjusts it perfectly to your eyes. On top of that, they have eye cameras inside, at least one camera per eye, maybe two, and that's meant to detect, you know, your eyeball movement so they can, you know, accurately represent your gaze. And again, it's, you know, they I heard they may have, you know, more than one camera per eye, you know, just because of inclusive, inclusive, uh, inclusivity uh, purposes. And then are are those cameras based on what we know? And again, this is all, you know, this is all based on sources, right? We have no actual hardware to point out and say, see, this is, this is what they're doing. But, um, are those cameras that are looking inward also providing the information for the supposed screens on the outside that, that, uh, project kind of emotion and I don't know, are they projecting eyes outward and to make things right, seem a little right. more human? Is that what that's supposed to be? Yeah, that's what I hear is that yeah. it's supposed to, you know, make you feel present with other people in the room, right? When you wear a VR, a VR <laughs> headset right now or even an AR headset, you know, it's kind of isolating, right? People are in the room with you, but it sounds like you're in a totally different world than them, uh, you know, standing, even standing next to each other. And so I think that was a big thing with Apple is that they didn't want to make a device that was isolating like that. And that's why when they went with AR, not VR. Uh, and uh, also, they, I think this outward screen is also what convinced them that, you know, it could work and people would actually use it and be able to interact with other people. Oh, man, in my mind, I just can't help but think that that's going to look really goofy. But then it's coming from a company who really spends their time making sure that they release a polished product that's going to be taken seriously. And so I can't imagine if they're doing that, I have to give them the credit that they probably deserve here to, to be like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to withhold my judgment on that feature until I actually see how it's implemented. Maybe they will they will do it and I'll be like, OK, you pulled it off. But it sounds a little weird. Um, another thing you write a, a pretty you know a lot about is this idea of uh, latency and a number of different facets, a number of different ways that this headset is addressing latency. You've got the H2 chip, you've got this custom streaming codec. Um, talk a little bit about the importance of latency to Apple and, and getting that down, especially not to mention, you know, you wrote about the uh, integration with AirPods and communication. I mean, all of these things have the potential to introduce latency. And we know with, with VR uh, hardware, if you have latency, it, I mean, it can make you sick depending on how, how right. steep that is. Right, right. I mean, VR is a little easier than AR because you're not also trying to uh, project, uh, you know, the outside world in and sync that up with your movements. So yeah, AR, right. in particular, latency is very important. And so, you know, Apple has done a lot of things to address this. One is that they have a special chip uh, code named Bora that's only there to process the images from the headset, from the cameras, and stitch them together into a, and correct their point of view uh, for your eyes. So, you know, the cameras are not placed directly where your eyes are. Um, there and uh, and on, on top of that, they would never be able to because even if they're placed where your eyes are, they'd be a little bit too forward. And so, uh, this is you know. You know, they have this chip that's supposed to reduce like the time, the lag between like what you see and in, in your movements. On top of that, 
um, you know, it has to sync with uh, the main processor, which is the M2. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, they had to build this like a uh, custom like kind of bridge between the two to you know speed up the conduit to speed up the communication. Uh, not just visual, but then you have audio too. Um, if you notice, uh, you know the Quest Two uh, from you know from Meta says that you're not supposed to use Bluetooth headphones with it, mm -hmm. and that's because there's you know there's a delay in the audio between uh, between that. You know it's just like too much of a delay. Uh, you know they recommend wired headphones uh, where they plug into an audio jack or, or use the speakers on uh, in the in the in the headband of the Quest Two. And, and Apple's the same way, except Apple won't have an audio jack. So what do you do? And so the solution they came up with was to um, uh, build in support for ultra low latency into the H2 chip, which is uh, used in the latest AirPods Pro uh, second generation. And probably, you know, I assume future AirPods that are going to come out uh, will have the same chip. And so there's an H2 chip in the headset and an H2 chip uh, in these new AirPods. And that's supposed to enable this ultra low latency mode as well. Of course, Apple doesn't uh, historically doesn't like. Uh, well, at least it's the joke. Don't like buttons. Don't like cables. You know, all you know, going more and more down this road of wireless. All so it doesn't surprise me, but it is a little strange. You know, that the uh, reliance on on wireless for audio. I'm also an audio. You know, an audio. Uh, I love audio. So that thing again is is one of those facets that yeah. man. I it just. I mean, me again, sick. there's also audio in the headband uh, as well. You know, yeah. They're going to sell. So, uh, but you know, if, if you're going to communicate with people. Uh, you know, do like tele teleconferencing or telepresence, you know, communication. I think there's some debate internally, like, should you just, should they require headphones? Because otherwise people can hear the yeah. conversation, you know, from the speakers in the headband. Right. Noise cancellation, uh, you know, from the audio that's coming out of a speaker into a room and then back through. Uh, not always that great. But again, I'll give uh, uh, Apple the benefit of the doubt and uh, it all remains to be seen. So many more details that folks need to check out. We really scratched the surface, but we only have a short amount of time with you. So I want to thank you for joining us. Wayne Ma writes for The Information. Of course, you can find his work on The Information. If people want to follow you online, are you on Mastodon these days? Twitter, where can people find you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter. It's at Wayne Ma. You know, just my first and last name, one word. Right on. Wayne, thank you so much for carving some time and Happy New Year. Tech Break on the Twit Network is brought to you by ACI Learning. IT Pro, formerly IT Pro TV, joins ACI Learning's audit, cyber, and IT learning solutions. Now combining the power of MIS Training Institute and LeaderQuest, IT Pro, alongside ACI Learning, delivers lifetime learning to 250,000-plus professionals across six continents. Visit acilearning.com and learn how ACI can level up your IT team.